Discover the hidden Israelite ancestry of some of the most powerful nations on earth. Watch as scripture unveils the terrifying future of America and Great Britain as revealed through the sabbatical and jubilee years. Discover the identity of Assyria and its role in this final jubilee cycle. Learn of the pending judgments that are to be soon poured out as a result of transgressing the sabbatical years. Sighted Moon. The 2300 days of hell, in order to get to that point, and while I'm speaking on this right now, there's a fella, and y'all met him from Australia. He got the revelation on this at the exact same time or within days of me getting it. And he began to work on it, and he calculated it all out, all these different things. And I'm now going to explain to you. I just happen to have the stage. But his stuff is also good. We differ on our conclusions, but he came up yesterday, and this was a, this was a priceless moment for me. He came up yesterday, and he, he walks around like this. He's got squinty eyes. You know those narrow, squinty eyes of people you don't trust? <laughs> no, he's awesome. He's awesome. But when he said this to me yesterday, his eyes opened up, and he said, I may have to rethink my position." Because that was awesome. The 2300 days of hell. And the two witnesses. And Joseph's seven years of plenty and seven years of famine all tie into what we've said. And I've dropped these little hints to you all the way along. So we've got to relearn how to count. Because so many people that you know and even you were so hooked into the Daniel timeline lie. No disrespect to the ministries that have been using it because at the time it seemed right. No disrespect, none at all. But if you are so entrenched in your position that you cannot change when you see that you need to change, then there's a problem. So I'm using this one because most of you know it and it's an example. I got another one coming up next. But you can see the 60 two weeks that they've changed to 62 years. You've seen the seven, and now they've changed the order. Instead of seven first, it's 62 first. And then the 1260 days, and then all these calculations that they do, and I look at this, and I get a headache. <laughs> I know that the stuff I've been presenting to you has given you many a migraine. This is typical of what's out there. And you now, all of you now, can show this not to be true. Here's the one from the Seventh-day Adventists. And they did it a little bit differently. And they ended up at 1844, based on the 2300 years, again starting from the 457 date. Now other people use the 455 date, or 456 date to start their teaching. And I'm showing you this as an example. No disrespect to the Seventh-day Adventists. Many of the people I meet there are brilliant, and know more Bible, and quote more Bible than I can. But again, it's wrong. Everyone compounds. When I say compound, they put everything into three and a half years. They put it all at the same time. The 1290, the 1260, the three and a half years tribulation. It's all at the same time. And my friend from Australia and I began to look at it as not at the same time, but linear. One leads into the next. And what we both found out is that they go from one holy day to the next, to the next, <clears throat> not to the next. They go from one holy day and they end up landing on another holy day, the appointed times. It's a method of keeping track of time when you don't have a moon to look at. What's coming is telling you the moon will be darkened and not give its light, the sun, a third of the sun. You know these scriptures, all these things are coming. There's going to be war, there's going to be smoke, there's going to be clouds, there's going to be, what's the second curse? Severe weather, tornadoes, floods, drought. It's still coming. So we started looking at it as a lineal thing. 
Okay, I'll get back to my notes. And this 2300 days, this 1290 days, the 1260, the 1335 days, the three and a half years can only be understood, Daniel's prophecy can only be understood once you understand the sabbatical and jubilee cycles and how they work. And you guys now get it. So now Daniel's prophecy is no longer sealed. And I've got so many books that say Daniel's prophecy is unsealed at last. And they go back hundreds of years and they repeat the same thing that we showed you yesterday was false. It's not about the Messiah. It's about you. It's about you in these last few days. Daniel 8 is where we're going today because this, yesterday was scary and so is this because now you're going to see just how long you have to hold your breath. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. But you, so this is the angel talking to Daniel. But you, shut up the vision, for it, is, it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business, and I was amazed at the vision, but there was no understanding. Daniel did not know what this was about, because he was already in captivity, and all these things that were bad had already happened. What is going on? It's sealed to the last days. Has it been unsealed? I think you all said yes yesterday in the camp. I was so blown away and excited and almost didn't go to sleep again last night because I was so excited. Now instead of being so depressed that they didn't want to hear it. The 2300 days of Daniel can only be understood in light of understanding the sabbatical and jubilee year cycles. And that's the only way you can understand this prophecy. So when do these 2300 days begin and end? And how does it work? You need to understand the holy days. You need to understand Leviticus 23. You need to know not to add to them and incorporate other teachings that revolve around holy days that are not found in Leviticus 23 because there's some good ones out there and they've almost convinced me except do not add, do not add, do not add to my Torah. So you don't add to it. There's no such thing as putting Hanukkah in here or Purim and developing a whole theology around those two holy days. I'm sorry. They are not here in Leviticus 23. And the minute you put that in there, you have polluted the truth and you're going to pollute the end results and you're going to get killed. I'm sorry. But if I don't tell you, who will? I'm already ready not to be liked. You need to know the sabbatical and jubilee are cycles and you need to understand the holy days because that is also key. We've seen this many times already and we, what we do is we've done is we've taken different cycles, different jubilee cycles and transposed them onto ours and just looked at them and said, what is this showing us? We've shown you the holy days and we started here with the eighth day as, as the year 2045. The last great day, the last great day of the feast, the seventh day of the feast is 2044. The feast of Sukkot, the first day of the feast of Sukkot is 2038. Five days earlier is the day of atonement, 2033. And 10 days below that, before that is 2024. And I was just doing an experiment. Just how does, how do the fall holy days fit with the sabbatical and jubilee cycles? And we got the first curse of terror, and the second curse of drought and famine and severe weather, and the third curse, which I call pestilence, and disease, and epidemics, and earthquakes, and the fourth curse of the sword. And you have seen how this keeps coming up, this fourth cycle keeps coming up over and over and over and over, and I've got eight different teachings that show that, and I wasn't looking for it. And then we got the fifth curse, the fifth curse of captivity right here. And why does that one overlap this 10 days of awe? And why are we told to afflict our souls? Go and read the newsletter sent out on the day of atonement. 
You guys were packing, traveling, whatever you was doing. Go and read it. I went fast. I was talking to people that knew what they did, understood already. I wasn't talking to the people that didn't understand the holy days. That was a special letter for you folks. How do we afflict our soul? How does that tie into the time of captivity? How does that tie into the day of atonement and the year of atonement and all that's going on in here? It is stunning. Stunning. And terrifying. So you now know, you now know there are 120 Jubilee cycles. You now know that the 50th one was the Exodus. You now know that at that 50th one, a burning bush spoke. And it told Moses to go and get my people and bring them back. Bring them back to restore and build my city, the city of my eye, Jerusalem. The people of my eye, Israel. Bring them back together. So I got my, my Jerusalem eye and my people eye together. I got both my eyes in my city. You know that. And you know that 70 Jubilee cycles later brings us to 2045. And I don't need to slap you upside the head no more because the sense has been knocked back in by Jehovah. But you can get a stick and go back home to your son because they need to be slapped upside the head to wake up and look, stop putting this off. The end of the Great Tribulation when Satan is locked away is 2033. I said that as a theory and I now believe it is concrete. I think I've proven it but you must do the same. So what I've done, what I've done in this teaching is I've just, I used 2033, theoretically, because I was still doing an experiment, as my benchmark. And I can't say benchmark because it's still a theory. And from that date, I just have to do, which is the same as I did here, reverse engineering. So I just reverse the fall holy days to arrive at these numbers to fill up the last half of the Jubilee cycle because the first half I knew was right. So reverse engineering has brought me to here. Now we have to do, because Satan, when Satan's locked away, that is the conclusion of the sixth millennial day. When that king, this king that rules this earth right now, is finally punished and locked away. So that is the conclusion of this time. So now we gotta reverse engineer from that time all these other clues that were given to arrive at wherever we arrive. And that's what we're going to do. So I just changed all my notes this morning. Sam, this one is different than the one you got. Because I just, I just, I had this, I just did. Because I wanted to mess up Sam. Um, so the first thing we noticed, the first thing we noticed was that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the last days. So that's on the fourth day. Jehovah's waiting just as long as possible to execute his judgment on the world. He waits as long as possible, and then he pulls the trigger. And I said, there's something going on there. I noticed that. And we've gone through this already. Then I noticed, because it says in Luke, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. What Sodom and Gomorrah got to do with Noah? So I noticed that Sodom and Gomorrah, 2047, after the creation of Adam, was when they were destroyed, because, because Isaac was born one year later. And I noticed that matches 2033. And I'm thinking, okay, there's something going on here. I've got to look at this more. So I knew that 2033 was now becoming an important date. In Revelation 20, so I, I got to look at the Day of Atonement, I got to understand what that's about. Revelation 20, because, you know, everyone's just been a good Christian, you don't read the Old Testament. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And he cast him into the abyss and shut him up and set a seal on him, that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. Okay, that's just rounding it up. It's saying until the 980, 900, when you say 900, it just doesn't flow off the tongue. So it's a thousand years should be filled, fulfilled. And after that, he must be let loose again. What? Who is the idiot with the key that's going to let him out? <laughs> we got to jump that guy when we get into the millennium. 
but he's going to be let loose again, right? He's going to be let loose. So if Satan's let loose, the question is, and now you have the answer because you know about David, if Satan is let loose, can the Messiah really be here and be holy and be on the earth with evil and sin at the same time? That answers that question. It now makes sense. Hmm. So for those of you, those of you who don't know what we're talking about here in Revelation 20, the answer is found in the Old Testament, the one that you don't want to read. Go to Leviticus, you know, do this, go to Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16, verse 8. This is talking about the Day of Atonement. And Aaron shall cast lots. Why? Because he can't tell the difference between the good Messiah and the fake Messiah. They look the same. Who knew? And if you stand back and look, people keeping Jesus today, who knew? And Aaron shall cast lots for the two he goats. One lot for, one lot for Jehovah and the other lot for a complete removal. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which Jehovah's lot fell and offer for a sin offering. That goat that's offered for a sin offering is taking you right back to Passover when Yeshua was offered as a sin offering. What are you allowed to do? You're allowed to take a lamb, one year old, or a goat. And that's your clue telling you it's talking about atonement. Verse 10, But the goat on which the lot fell to be the complete removal shall be presented alive before Jehovah to make atonement with him to let him go for a complete removal into the wilderness. That goat is called the Azazel goat. And people say, and this is how Satan works. He's got you believing that that goat is paying the price for someone else's sin. The scapegoat. No, he's the guilty goat. That's why all the sins are placed on his head. Because he's the one that it started with. And if that rubs you the wrong way, the end of the Great Tribulation is when Satan is locked away. This day is a day of atonement. That year is 2033. This is the 120th Jubilee cycle when all these prophecies must be fulfilled and completed. If, if we are not in the 120th Jubilee cycle, then we still have time to party. But if you can prove that we are got one more Jubilee cycle left, because all you got to do is add it up. All you got to do is add it up. It's there. 2,500 years, right there in Genesis, up to the entry into the Promised Land. It's right there, Genesis and Exodus. 2,500, and you can do that. The other part of the puzzle is, from the fourth year of Solomon down to our day, it's right there. And the connection between the two, because one is modern history and one is ancient history, and we don't know where they are, is that connection of that 412 years, the mystery X number that we went through the other day. That's how you connect them together. Because it can't be more than 120 years, 120 Jubilee cycles. But Matthew 24 gives us something else. Because people, saw, people think it's got to end there. So, okay, I got from 2013, I've got to 2045. Party hard. Party hardy. No. 20, Matthew 24, 22. And unless those days should be shortened, no flesh would be saved. No flesh. Zero. But for your sake, those days shall be shortened. Those days, remember a day is as a year, so those days from here to here has been shortened. We are at the end of the sixth millennial day. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are that last generation. Stunning as that sounds, because, you know, we've always just been playing religion all these years. And now the rubber meets the road. And that's, you know, because the rubber's meeting the road here and I got to sort of wake you up, I'm trying to shake you up. And I'm trying to say things to shock you. And maybe that's why my potty mouth is a little bit potty, because I got to get you out of your Baptist Puritan position. Things are going to get ugly. And my potty mouth won't matter then. So if I have my understanding correct, then all the timelines must end with the locking away of Satan in 2033. 
So we know from Jewish mythology about the ten days of awe. And I've just said those ten days are ten years to go from here to there. But that was interesting because that also that also covered the uh, the years of captivity, and I was wondering how does that work? What's going on here? When you're in captivity, and what I'm going to be showing you here today is just how bad this is. Well, maybe not so much because I'm trying to get to the 2,300 days. I'm trying to show you how that fits in. But you know, in captivity, it's going to be bad. Remember at the beginning, I showed you the people who went out in their regular street clothes and they ended up in a prison camp? It's coming. Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and those tabernacling in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil came down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has but a little time. Now, for the first time, we've been able to record this. And for the first time, I've been able to say the whole complete package in one spot, one sitting. A little bit in the newsletter here, there, somebody reads this part, they miss next week, blah. I come to a conference, I got to try and jam all this into 10 hours. And people are done after three. And they go out of there, what just happened? And don't remember it all. And I leave there mad because I didn't get it all in. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted you, you who are the seed who know the truth. And two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman so that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for times, time and a half time. There's the three and a half years from the serpent's face. So now we have a clue. We have something to work with. And the serpent cast out of his mouth. Listen carefully to what we're about to read. The serpent cast out of his mouth water. That's an army like a flood. That's the army after you. The woman so that he might cause her to be carried away by the river. And the earth helped the woman. Remember Korah? The earth opened up. Swallowed Korah. Guess what's going on? Guess what's going on in the Dead Sea area now? Huge sinkholes are popping up all over the place. Exciting. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river, the army, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Listen carefully. And the dragon, so the woman has now fled into the wilderness. All those believers are now fled into the wilderness. So the question is, who are these people that keep the Ten Commandments that are left behind? Who are these people? And the dragon was enraged and over the woman because she got away and went to make war with the rest of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. Who are these? We've just explained the times, time and a half time. That's three and a half years. So if we use that as our benchmark, as our starting point, that's the Day of Atonement in 2033. The Day of Atonement in 2033. Now you count back three and a half years. That brings you to Passover in 2030. Passover 2030 is a Shemitah year. What's going on, folks? What's going on? Clues, bells, Flags going up, come on, there's stuff going on here, what's going on? The dragon, she flees into the wilderness at this time. We're to flee at Passover. You're to eat Passover with your staff in your hand, your coat on, your shoes on, and you're to be eating it in a hurry. If you're sitting there relaxing, having a cup of wine, and five cups of wine, and you're starting to feel the effects of the fifth cup of wine, and you're yakking and having a good time, and you're not done your meal, you're not rehearsing. I went to some friends of mine. I had Passover in Israel with Nehemiah Gordon and his family before his father died. He's such an awesome man to meet. And I can see the brilliance passed on to his son from his dad. And they're talking, and I'm talking. They bring out the meal. And they asked me a question, like some of you, you asked me a question at supper time. So I start telling the answer. Next thing you know, they're all done. And I haven't even started. And they're ready to take my plate away. And they're looking at me like, 
What is the matter with you? Eat. Wolf that food down and shut up. It's a rehearsal. But it's Shabbat Shuva. Shabbat Shuva. Hear, O Israel. Hear. Return, O Israel, and bring the Torah scrolls. We, you know, this is, we've shown you this stuff already this week. What's going on? What's the big controversy? Conjunction or cited? One or the other? Which one is it going to be? Actually, that's my title of the article. Conjunction or cited which? You know, I'm a little bit biased, citedmoon.com. We didn't call ourselves conjunctionmoon.com. Go and prove it because it will be decided here at this time. One group, because of the way the calendars are going to work out and because we can't know the day or the hour because of the barley, we have to wait till the barley shows up and that's determined by the sun. We have to wait till we see the moon. Once we know the barley is going to be right for Passover, because you need a wave offering for Passover in the days of unleavened bread. If you don't have barley, you don't have a wave offering. If you wait too long, the barley recedes itself, and you don't have a wave offering. And that the, all you can do is maybe give the last fruits, not the first fruits, the last fruits of the barley harvest. So you need the barley. That's determined by the sun. What does Genesis say? We need two witnesses. What's the other witness? That's somebody that you can see or somebody that thinks that something that you see, not something that is hidden. So the other witness is the moon, the first crescent of the moon. That's your witness. No man shall know the day or the hour. That's talking about the Feast of Trumpets. And when no man knows the day or the hour, that's because we don't know when we're going to see the moon. Oh, but all you smart guys, all you real smart Christians saying, we don't believe you, Joe, because you're making dates and no man can know the day or the hour. That's because you're dummies. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't know what that's talking about is ignorant of the holy days. Because the holy days are determined by the sighted moon. And if you don't know when that is, you need to learn it. Grow up, suck it up, man up, and figure this out. Stop being a patsy and believing all the lies you've been given. During the ten days of awe, between trumpets and atonement, is Shabbat Shuva. It begins at Passover. The Sabbath between Yom Teruah and Yom HaKippurim is called Shabbat Shuva, the Sabbath of Return. This name is derived from the Sabbath special half Torah reading, which begins with the word Shuva, Israel. Return, O Israel. They're already in the land. No, they're going to be taken out because Israel and Judah, Israel, Mik, you, fall together. Is also called Shabbat Shuva because of its falls during the ten days of Teshuva, repentance. Again, atonement, repentance, afflict your souls. What are we talking about? Captivity. Get the point. Understand, this is huge. Hosea 14. O Israel, return to Jehovah. Return to keeping the way. Return to me. How I've wanted to gather you in my wings, but you would not listen, O Jerusalem. Your hard hearts, your stubborn minds, your sickening excuses. Return to Jehovah your God, for you have fallen by your iniquity. Take with you the Torah scrolls and turn to Jehovah. Say to him, take away all my sins, take away all the stupid things I've been doing all my life and receive us graciously that we may repay with the calves of our lips. There's a bull, there's another calf, there's another sheep. What was I doing here at the beginning? I was offering praise to my Yah, the calves of my lips, the offer for, uh, offerings and sacrifices from my prayers, from your prayers. Here we have in Hosea, verse 3, Assyria, we've already talked about it, Assyria, shall not save us. That's a deception that's going to fool so many people because they're going to think Assyria is our Savior. 
I can feel myself doing that dance again with my knees going side to side, but you can't see it, but it's so good back here. We will not ride on horses, nor shall we say any more to the work of our hands, our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. And we are, or were, fatherless. We had no God. We had no L. As long as we remained in our adulterous way of life. I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. What's Malachi say? What does he say? He's going to turn the hearts of the children to the father. Lest he come and smite them with a curse. What are those curses? Leviticus 26. That's the curse. They're already happening. So if you don't get these other people on board with the Father, turn them back. They're dead. I will be as a dew to Israel. Remember the dew? What's the dew? The manna that fell in Israel. I will be as a dew to Israel. He shall grow as the lily. There's so much rich stuff in here, and we just read over it like, I got to go to bed in 50 minutes. I got to finish this chapter first. This is big stuff. Stop. Turn off the TV and read this. I will be as a dew to Israel. He shall grow as a lily and cast out his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall receive like the grain and grow like the vine. Their scent shall be as the vine of Lebanon. Ephraim, Ephraim shall say, what have I to do with idols anymore? Why was I so stupid to keep going back to that, thinking that that was my God, when all it was was a tradition? I have heard him and watched him. I am like a green fir tree. Your fruit is found from me, from me, from your Torah. Who is wise, and he shall understand these things. Who understands these things? Understanding, and he shall know them. Who's going to know them? Who's going to understand them? How do you figure this stuff out? By keeping the Torah. And as you keep it, more revelations come, and you start connecting this and that and the other thing. Sometimes I can't read two verses without going through like half the Bible because I see so many connections that I haven't explored yet. So sometimes I don't want to read the Bible because I haven't got time to search them all out. For the ways of Jehovah are right, and the just shall walk in them. But sinners shall fall. They're not going to understand. Add stuff to the Torah. Continue to be blind. So the other part of that half Torah reading is Joel. Listen to what it says. Blow a trumpet of Zion. Sanctify a fast, an affliction. Call a solemn assembly. And you guys keep coming back here every day, and I'm so thankful. Because it's hard to just talk to a camera. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregations. So right now, blow a trumpet. That's a feast of trumpets. Sanctify a fast. That's the Day of Atonement. What are we doing here? This is a warning. This is the ten days of awe. There's something big going on here. What is it? Gather the elders. Where are the elders here? Where are the men in Israel learning this stuff? Where are the men teaching this about in Jubilee years? That grieves my soul, but now I see you. I see you here. For the first time, I'm seeing men stand up. Gather the children, those who suck the breast. Let the bridegroom grow forth. The bridegroom. Ten days of awe, feast of trumpets, day of atonement, bridegroom. Ten day, the day and hour no one knows, bridegroom. Feast of trumpets, no one knows the day or the hour, bridegroom. Connections, connections, connections. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her room. Let the priests and the ministers of Jehovah weep. Why are we going to cry? Why are we weeping? Because you're coming out of captivity and you're seeing it happen. 
and you're seeing how bad it was, and now you're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and you just got to get there. Endure, endure until the end. Weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, have pity on your people, O Jehovah. Please, Father, Jehovah, have mercy. And give not your inheritance to shame for a proverb among those nations. Let them not be making fun of how you've destroyed us. Let them not live and endure, and that be the saying about us. And let them not go around saying, where's their God? Look at them. They got nothing. They're naked. They're shaved. They're walking around the camp. They got no food. They're dying by the millions. There's no God. That's what they'll be saying. Then Jehovah will be jealous. You want to get a man jealous? Tick off, tick him off. Hurt his wife. Hurt his kids. Hurt his fiance. And that's who we have. I can't wait for them to get, get him ticked off. Then Jehovah will be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yes, Jehovah will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and wine and oil. Well, the Baptists aren't there, we know that. And wine and the oil, and you shall be satisfied with it. And I will no more make you a curse. No more will you be a curse. And you're only a curse because of your backsliding, anti-Torah, nail-to-the-tree ways. But I will remove the northern army far from you and will drive him into a barren and deserted land. Hang on. Shabbat Shuva, Torah reading, half Torah reading, northern army. What's going on? And his face will be towards the eastern sea. Which way is he running? And his rear, his backside, toward the western sea. Because he's running for his life. And his stench shall come up, and his ill odor shall come up, because he was doing great things. Their dead bodies are going to stink to high heaven. Yes! Genocide of our enemies. You're not supposed to say that. We're supposed to be God-loving people. Yes, they're going to be killed and wiped out. And no more will they hurt us, because we're going to keep the Torah. All of us. Fear not, O land, and be glad, and rejoice, for Jehovah will do great things. Do not be afraid, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness grow green. The desert in Israel is going to grow green. I've told you when I planted the vineyard, it rained. And the, all these sand dunes are now were green. <laughs> it was such an amazing sight. Who knew? For the tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine yield, the vine yields it their strength. Be glad then, sons of Zion, and rejoice in Jehovah your God, for he has given you the former rain according to, the righteous, according to righteousness. In order for the rain come, you must be keeping Torah. The Ten Commandments, all your commandments are righteousness. You being obedient gives you rain at the right time, gives you plants, gives, turns the desert into something that's beautiful. Wow, who knew? And he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That's Rosh Hashanah. No, that's Aviv, the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with, vine and, with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years which the swarming locust has eaten, the locust larva, and I know all about them now, and the stripping locusts, I know about them too. And the cutting locusts, they're the ones that eat the bark and destroy the plant. And that was his army coming to tell me which plants were his for his teaching me. My great army, which I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Jehovah. Praise his name, your God who has dealt with you wonderfully, and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of you. I get up every morning, I look at that lake, and there's all these mists 
dancing around on top. Like you can see them dancing. I will be in the midst of you. That's his Shekinah. That's his glory in the cloud. He's in the midst. Where'd the manna come from? It came out of the cloud, the hoary cloud every morning. He's in the midst. And that I am Jehovah your God and no one else. No one else. There's no other names there. And my people shall never, never be ashamed. Shabbat Shuvah, that Torah reading that we just talked about, Shabbat Shuvah, this is a pivotal date. It's changing from our captivity to our escape during this time, and all this stuff is going to be given to us if we obey. But, but, there's more. It's a prophecy to us once we understand the sabbatical cycles. It's a prophecy to us. So now let's continue to go back. Let's start to reverse engineer, keep going back. Daniel 12, 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the desolation of abomination set up, a thousand two hundred ninety days shall occur. Let's just leave that one on the shelf for a minute. I had to put that there so you know where I was talking about. We got to put that on the shelf because that's a huge clue. But we don't know where, where that starting point is yet. So let's just go to verse 12. We're going to go verse 12. We can do that one. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Again, what I'm showing you today is what I see. This is not my prophetic announcement. It's my, what I see. And that could change next week. I changed these notes this morning. So it could change next week. This is my understanding now. It's not written in stone. Okay? So if this changes next week, I am not going to be called a false prophet. Yes, I will. But not by you. Because you know this is just what I see right now. The 1300 and or the, uh, what is that, 1,335 days ends on Shavuot. It starts at Passover. No, it starts at trumpets. I'm sorry. Correct me if I got it wrong. It starts at trumpets. 1,335 days later brings us to Shavuot. And I wanted to show you on the eighth day what that means. What does Shavuot mean? How does that fit into the plan, the whole plan? Here's part of the answer. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these who are arrayed in white robes? And from where do they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. We're going to, what? We're supposed to be raptured. No, that's not what it says. How could, no, I got to go through the tribulation. I'm supposed to be raptured. I don't have to do nothing. I'm just going to be raptured out. Oops. You got to change your thinking, folks. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and and have whitened them in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he sitting on the throne will dwell among them. So this takes place on Shabbat Shuvah. It takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation. Shabbat Shuvah is what? Maybe I won't teach this on, maybe I'll teach it right now. The first wave offering. What's that? The barley. We have to have barley, right? So what's the barley represent? It represents the saints. How do we know? When the barley is taken, okay, here's how they do this. They go out on the day before Shabbat, the day before the weekly Shabbat, as the days of unleavened are about to begin, or as the days of unleavened bread are already taking place. Whenever that Shabbat is, during the days of unleavened bread, it's the Friday before. So they go out and they mark the barley. This is the barley that's ripe. This is the one we're going to use. They mark this and they mark a bunch of them. And then the priest comes along, on the after Shabbat. 
Now, the Pharisees have changed it and said they can do it on Shabbat because they got some other teachings that have been twisted. But let's say we do it the way the Sadducees do, which are like the Karaites, which are, it's after the Shabbat. So they come out and the priest says, there's a big crowd, this is a big ceremony done on the Sabbath that night. And the priest says, is this the barley? And the people say, yes. And the priest says, is this the barley? And the people say, Louder, because he does it three times because we got to get you warmed up. And the priest says, is this the barley? And the people say, yes. Yeah, that's better. Is this the sickle that we cut the barley with? And the people say, yes. And the priest says, because he didn't hear it, is this the sickle that we cut the barley with? Yes. And he does it three times. Is this the sickle we cut the barley with? Yes. And then he asks, has the sun set? Yes. yes. Oh, man. What is it, your first time? And then the priest says, has the sun set? Yes. And he says, because you had to go and check twice, you weren't sure the first, has the sun set? Yes. Okay. Is this the basket I'm supposed to put the barley in? Yes. yes. Is this the basket I'm supposed to put, because you got to have other parts in the people don't know, and it's, yes. oh, come on. Is this the basket I'm supposed to put the barley in? Yes. There we go. It's a huge celebration. It's a great thing because now we got the first fruits of our, client, our land and once that's cut and offered, now we can go harvest our barley. It's not the last fruits. If it's the last fruit, you're giving Jehovah the crap. So it's a big ceremony that they do Saturday night. And what happens Saturday night? Because they take it into the, the temple and they beat the barley. They beat it. A threshing machine. All these priests going at this barley, getting it ready. Oh, I love that stick. And then they bring it in and they separate it out. They get the good kernels, the ripe kernels. When was the lamb ever beaten? When was the lamb of God that was a sacrifice ever beaten? The lamb is never beaten. But Yeshua was beaten. The barley is representing Yeshua. I'm wore out from beating the barley. So the barley is Yeshua. Now, let's back up. I'm off my notes. This is Sunday's teaching. Now I can do something else on Sunday. Great. Matthew 27, verse 50, somewhere around there. I don't know where. Somewhere 50. Yeshua dies. He gives it up. It is finished. What happens? The graves are raised. That's the barley being marked. Okay, wow. Look at that connection. The graves being raised, that's the barley being marked. And then what? Then it says those graves that were marked, excuse me, those graves that were marked after he rose from the grave, after Yeshua came out of the grave, after he was in the grave, three days, three nights, Thursday night, no, Wednesday night, he had to be, Wednesday was the day he was killed, the middle of the week. Again, that ties into what we're talking about here later. Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, three nights, Thursday day, Friday day, Saturday day, three days, that's three days and three nights. Can you count? One, two, three. Some people go one and a half and say that's three. If Yeshua wasn't in the grave three days and three nights, he's not your Messiah because that is your only clue. That's your only proof that he's the Messiah. So if you're counting one, two, or one and a half, or one and three quarters, he's not your Messiah. Because my Messiah was three days and three nights. So, he comes out of the grave Saturday afternoon, late. He went in the grave early, or late, Wednesday afternoon. That's three days and three nights. When he comes out of the grave, what happens to those graves that were raised up? The saints came out of there. And they go into Jerusalem. That's the barley going in Saturday night. Mary catches up to Yeshua at the tomb. Mary sees him, recognizes him. He's not the gardener. He's not a ghost. He's real. She goes to hug him. He says, stop. Don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. 
What's he talking about? The wave offering on Sunday morning. When? At 9 o'clock. 9 and 3, 9 and 3, 9 and 3. He was put on the tree at 9. He died at 3. That's when you do the bullocks of your lips. That's when you make your prayers. Not when you're falling asleep at your pillow at 10 o'clock at night. Not when you first get up and you still got sleep in your eye. Yes, do that if you have to. But try and make 9 and 3 your appointed time to meet your maker. It's hard. I've been trying to do it. It's hard. I don't always get it done. So, that's the wave of What does Paul say? He led a host of captives with him. Who are the captives? Those are the ones captured by Satan because Jehovah didn't make you to die. Satan made you die. You're captured by Satan. And yeah, you're in hell. Oh no, there he goes again talking about those bad words. Hell. Say it out loud. Say it in front of your mom. It means a hole in the ground. Hades is a hole in the ground. Gehenna, hell. Gehenna. Remember I showed you the Gehenna Valley? That's where they threw all their garbage. And as long as they kept throwing garbage and the dead people that they didn't want, it was a dump. It kept burning. It never, ever went out. But now I take tours down there because it's almost like a golf course. And guess what? Guess what? It's so good. Tell your mom. I've seen a snowflake in hell. Okay, so it snows in hell. What's going on? You got a misunderstanding of what the word means. It's a hole in the ground. That's all it is. When you go in your basement every day, you're going to hell. And if you take a basket, you're going to hell with a hand basket. Okay, so now, let's get back. You've had your swear lesson word for today. Yeshua, Yeshua is that wave offering. But we have another wave offering at Shavuot. Yeshua said, no man has gone to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. So before that, nobody went to heaven. Not Elijah, not Moses, not David, nobody, nobody except Yeshua. And that wave offering was done one time. So the next wave offering is Shavuot. That's coming. Everyone who has lived since Messiah, since he came out of the grave, is now going to be in that resurrection if they are keeping the Torah. And if you're not keeping the Torah, oh, well, that's another teaching for another day. But that's the one we're working towards. What's that? It's made out of wheat. It's the wheat. What are we always talking about? You're the wheat. There's tares all around. He's going to pull us out and throw the tares into the fire. The wheat is what we want to be. We want to be in that Shavuot offering. And that's when the 144,000 are raised up. Is that going to be some of you? Maybe. Wow, he's really got a lot of work to do. You could be. Who knows? I don't know how it's going to work. But it's going to be 144 plus. There's going to be others. And then there's so much I still don't know. Here's the first wave offering, Leviticus 23.10. It's the barley. And that was done Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Oh, there, I should read my notes a little bit better. Here's the stuff we're talking about. Matthew 27, verse 50. 51, 52, and 53. I'm not going to repeat it. I just went through all this. Leviticus 2, verse 12, tells you how the offering is to be prepared. This grain offering had to be roasted. It's to be put frankincense. What's frankincense? The prayers of the saints. It's to have lots of salt. What's the salt? You are the salt of the earth. Make the connections. See where they lead you. Great understandings. Leviticus 2, go and read it. Ephesians 4, therefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. But now Christ has risen from the dead. Uh, this 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Christ has risen from the dead 
and has become the first fruits, not the last fruits of the barley. barley. There's groups this year keeping the last fruits of the barley. They're keeping the Sukkot next month based on the last fruits of the barley, or they don't even acknowledge the barley because they're keeping it according to a equinox. Where's that mentioned here? Nowhere. Yeah, I get mad. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who slept. Slept. They're not dead. They're only sleeping. For since death is through man, he re- the resurrection of the dead also is through a man. And as in Adam all die, even all, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. There's a clue. Shavuot is in order. It follows the Days of Unleavened Bread and the first wave offering. I forgot what that word is, but you'll know. And then there's another time. We're supposed to go up to Jerusalem three times a year. And so far we've seen one come true and we're waiting for the second one. What's the third one? That'll be later. Well, I'll tell you about that on another day because it's just so big. Three times. The three times are talking about the three times, the three plans of raising men up to be with Jehovah. So we're talking about Shavuot. And it's the first fruits. That's you. A wave offering. An offering you're a gift to Jehovah. Do not say, John 4, verse 35, do not say, it is yet four months till the harvest comes. What's he looking at? He's looking at Sukkot. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, open up your eyes and look, for the fields are already white and the harvest is ready. Shavuot. Shavuot is in June. So you have June, it's at the beginning of June, the end of May. So you have June, July, August, September, and that's the seventh month. Septem, septem is seven is the seventh month, September in Latin. Ak is the eighth month. The ninth month is Nov. Dec is ten in Latin, tenth month. Wow, it's right there, even today. Three times a year to go up to Jerusalem. Daniel 12, 12. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. So what I'm telling you is that Shavuot, on the day or the year of atonement, four months before Satan's locked away, four months before he's locked away in the day of atonement, in the year of atonement, that is when this is going to take place, the 144,000. They've gone through the tribulation. Shabbat Shuvah, 2030, a sabbatical year. Why does Israel flee? How did they get back to the land? Okay, so we've got them in captivity. What's happening? We're doing reverse engineering. Let's figure out the rest of this. We've got to figure this out because we're trying to come back. We're not trying to get there, but we end up there, and it's amazing. Revelation 11, and I will give power to my two witnesses. Oh, we forgot about the two witnesses. Where'd they go? I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy a thousand two hundred and sixty days. Uh oh. Uh oh. Let's go back. Let's go back. Whoops, wrong one. I didn't forget. I'm just pretending we forgot. The two witnesses have to do a job because they bring you back to Israel. And it's the things that they do. Remember Moses? Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Remember Elijah? He did some stuff. The two witnesses, they're going to do that stuff. And they will prophesy 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God, before the God of the earth. And if anyone will hurt them, fire proceeds out of the mouth and devours their enemies. And if everyone, anyone will hurt them, so it is right for him to be killed. These have authority to shut up, oh, here we go, to shut up the heavens, that it may rain, not rain, in the days of their prophecy. What did Elijah do? No rain, three and a half years. And they have authority over water to turn them to blood. Whoops, there's Moses. What Moses doing? And to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. They're just going to have zip, zip, whoever they want. Uh-oh. Here's the fine print. And when they complete their testimony, the beast coming out, out of the abyss will make war against them and will overcome them and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Gomorrah, or Sodom and Egypt, Jerusalem, where also our Lord was crucified. And many of the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will see their dead bodies, TV, 
Facebook, three days and a half, and they will not allow their dead bodies to be put in tombs. And the ones who dwell on the earth will rejoice. Why? Because the drought's over. They've been causing not to rain. Now it's raining. They're done. Oh, I'm so glad they're gone. Let's get back to partying. And we'll make merry. Oops, there it is. And send one another gifts because the two prophets tormented these, those living on the earth. 1260 days. 1260 days. Three and a half years. Those are 30 day months. And if you cannot see the moon during those 1260 days, so a moon comes around every 29.53 days. So if you can't see the moon, do you see the moon here? It's there. That's the first crescent moon. So if you can't see the moon on the 29th day, it's a 30-day month. That's why all these things are given to you in 30-day increments. It's got nothing to do with the time of Noah being in the boat and going back to a 360-day year. That is also in the book and explained. The reason Noah counted, what, five months, uh, five times 30 is, what, 150 days he was inside the ark? Inside the ark. Look up, do you see the moon here? You're inside the barn here. He's inside the ark, he can't see the moon. So he counts 30 days. When he opens up the window and looks outside and sets the birds out to go find land, he can now see the moon. So he doesn't count 30 days anymore. That's why that stops. Who knew? Okay, there's the moon. So if you can't see the moon because the clouds, the smoke, and the fires, and the, the forest trees, forest on fire, it's a 30-day month. Three and a half years of tribulation from 2030 to 2033. 1335 days from Shavuot during the tribulation with one leap year in there. One leap year. Both starting at 2030. Shabbat Shuvah. The three and a half years of tribulation starts at Passover and the 1335 days, I believe, I could be wrong, I may change this next month, but right now I believe they start at Trumpets. Now, the two witnesses also work for 1260 days, and there's no leap year in there. So we have Moses and Aaron, we have Elijah and Elisha, and we have John the Baptist. These are our examples that we can use to help draw conclusions about what the two witnesses are going to be doing. So that has brought us back to a certain point. And I heard another voice in heaven saying, come out of her. This is what they're doing. Come out of her. Who are they talking to? You. Where are you in captivity? Come out of her. Where's your captivity? Well, the Bible tells you it's in Assyria. Where's Assyria? That's Germany. And you're going to also be sold on the slave market in Egypt. What is that? That's somebody building up his harem at your expense. Think about it. You're going to be sold in the slave markets of Egypt, and you're going to be sold as slaves up in Assyria. Come out of her, my people, do not be caught in the plagues that are about to happen to them. But you can't just get up and go. So here's some things to think about. Babylon is given to you as examples throughout your entire Bible. You need to know who Babylon is. Babylon was Egypt when he took Sarah. Sarah represented Israel. She was captive to his potential harem. Babylon is Egypt with Joseph. Babylon was Egypt with Moses. Babylon is Assyria with Israel during the 700s. Babylon was Babylon with Judah. Oh, we can all figure that one out because it's right there, black and white. Babylon was also the Greek and Roman and Persian and Median Persian uh, empires that fought against Israel. All these examples of Babylon, because that is the Babylonian Empire. And what is it called today? The United Nations, the United European Union, and Assyria, and Germany. That is the monster that we have to go slay. This is huge. This is huge. And you and I are David.
Revelation 11, 6. These have authority to shut up the heavens, to talk about the two witnesses, that it may not rain in the days of their prophecy. And they have authority to over waters to turn into blood. Have I just said this? Here we go. 1 Kings 17. And Elijah the Tishbite of the sojourners of Gilead said to Ahab, as, he, as Jehovah the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except according to my word. So we have an example of there of what the two witnesses are going to do at the end. James 5. Elijah was a man of like passion. He was passionate. Wow, who knew? As we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for the time of three years and six months. And guess what? Some of you prayed that we didn't have to move the venue to a different place or be outside in the bush again. And we don't have to move tonight because this wedding that was coming tonight is canceled. Who knew? Luke 4, 25, but I tell you truly, you don't know your prayers can be answered. All you got to do is ask. You don't get because you don't ask, and you don't ask because it's not according to his will. Now you know his will, you know what's coming, you can ask. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel, listen carefully, in the days of Elijah. Why? Because of the drought. They dropped dead like flies, and there were many widows in town. When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, where did this curse take place? In Israel. And when these two witnesses take place, one quarter of the earth's population will die. One quarter. Seven billion. That works out to be about 1.7 billion people. I think they're going to get somebody's attention. And no, that's not the heart machine working. Some people are so gullible. 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come for the judgment to begin from the house of God, the house of Israel, and if it first begins from us, what will be the end of those disobeying Torah? And if the righteous, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where shall the ungodly, the sinner, appear? Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls in well-doing as to, the, to a faithful creator. Times are going to be tough and we are going to barely make it by the skin of our teeth. And if that's us, what about them? Revelation 6, 8, And I look and behold a pale horse, and the name of him sitting on it was death, and hell, oops, Hades, followed with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and by the beasts of the earth. One quarter of the earth's population is going to die. 1.7 billion people. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. And I'm hoping that's not me. That's why we need more of you to volunteer. And the testimony which they held, I like my head, on my shoulders, attached to my neck. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Until when? Until when, Master? How long? Holy and true, do you not judge? Why are you taking so long to avenge our lives, our blood on those who dwell on the face of the earth? Oh, forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. No. Go get them, Father. Go get them. And white robes were given to each one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little time until both their fellow servants and their brothers, those about to be killed as they were, should have their number made complete. Why? Why do we eat Passover in haste? Exodus 12, 11. And you shall eat of it this way with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in a hurry. It is Jehovah's Passover. And when you see Jerusalem compassed and armies, then know that its destruction has come. And let those in Judea flee to the mountains, and those in the midst of let them not go out, or let them go out. And those in the open spaces, let them not go into her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. 
you need to know what's going on. You need to understand. For it shall be as a fleeing bird, Isaiah 16, 2, for it shall be as a fleeing bird cast out of the nest. The daughters of Moab shall be the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, take counsel, do judgment, make your shadow as the night in the midst of the noonday. Make your shadow as the night in the middle of the noonday. Hide the outcasts. Do not betray the fugitive, Moab. Let my outcast dwell with you, Moab. Be a shelter to them from the face of the destroyer, from the extortioner. For the extortioner is at an end. The spoiler ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. Moab is where the brethren flee. Moab is going to hide us. Now then, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together of him, we ask you, do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, not me. Not me. Let no one deceive you and not me. For that day will come unless the fall, that day will not come unless the falling way comes first, and the man of sin of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits in the he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. A lot of stuff there. He's coming. Exodus 23, 14, three times, okay, I'm repeating myself, three times in a year, three times in a year, you're to go up to Jerusalem, three times in a year. Again, reemphasizing that point of the wave offering, the wave offering, and the rest of the first fruits offering. So, the two witnesses are killed here. Passover, they're teaching for three and a half years, they're working for three and a half years. We have Three and a half year tribulation. We have the 13, 35 years coming back to trumpets here. The two witnesses are killed here. But they preach for three and a half years. So from Passover, we count backwards. Three and a half years, and that brings us to trumpets, 2026. These appointed days are there for you. Keep them. They teach you things. Trumpets, 2026. Now, look what just happened. Look what just happened. We've got two and a half years here. Remember the curses at the Exodus? What happened to the first three curses on Israel? Do you think you might be protected after that during the drought for no rain for three and a half years? Maybe. Do you think the people that have you prisoner and captives might see the blessing that you're bringing to them? Because they're going to be alive because of you. Maybe. But the first couple years, two and a half years, okay, what's this for? What's that mean? That's when you're supposed to see them coming in the clouds. I think, I think. 2024 represents the Feast of Trumpets when he comes. He came September 11th, 9 11, 3 BC on the Feast of Trumpets, his first time. He wasn't born Christmas. He was born on the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no man can know. He's going to come back on the Feast of Trumpets at a day and hour no man can know because we won't know when the moon is or the barley. It could be a month difference. Who, who knew? The Feast of Trumpets right here. So there's three and a half years here that we got, two and a half years here, we got to, what's going on? Then, Isaiah 14, 2, Then people will take them and bring them to their place. Where's their place? Back in the land. And the house of Israel will possess them. Possess who? The people that are bringing them. Possess them for servants and maids in the land of the Lord. They will take them captive who captives they were. Think about it. You're going to be brought back there with a chain around your neck. You're going to be brought back to the land of Israel because they're going to bring you there by freight car or plane by boat. And once you get to the border, you go through customs, the Israeli customs, and they take the chain off your neck. There's no customs, folk. 
They take the chain off your neck. Some of you are so serious. They take the chain off their neck and you put it on their neck because they are now your slaves. That's right here. Isaiah, that's what he's saying. But why? Why do they do this? What's going on? Just like in the Exodus, Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. Moses kept saying, let us go three days hence to worship. Let us go. I think he does it ten times. And Pharaoh says, yes, then no. Yes, then no. It's the same thing. It's, re- just, it's a rehearsal for what's coming. Only now, instead of just being a little bit, it's huge. It's worldwide. This is big. Psalm 44, 22. Yet for your sake, Jehovah's sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul says the same thing in Romans 8. So what does this mean? What does this mean? These two witnesses have been causing all kinds of trouble all over the earth by their commands for the rains to stop and waters to turn to blood. It's a rehearsal. All the holy days are rehearsal. Shabbat Shuvah 2030. So now let's go to Revelation 6, 9. And when he said, open the fifth seal, I saw under there the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. Us sheep. We're sheep for the slaughter. So why am I saying this? Because I'm telling you that martyrdom takes place at Shabbat Shuvah 2030. The ten days of awe climax come to a conclusion on the Day of Atonement. We only afflict our soul on the Day of Atonement. It's the climax. But that affliction has taken place for the ten years before plus some. Afflict your soul. You're going to be sucking dust, hugging that ground with your face, sucking dust, begging to be alive. This is going to be such a scary time because when that leaf turns there, you're going to think someone's there and you're going to run. When it turns there, you're going to run. And you won't know which way to run. You're going to feel so hopeless, so alone. It's going to be the scariest time ever. So now let's look at the other example. I've already shown this. This is the Jubilee cycle for Jacob's life and he worked seven years to get Rachel and at the end he's deceived and he gets Leah and he works seven more after that. That just so happens to match up to our time cycle here which I think we can draw conclusions from doing that analysis back and forth. We're coming back. The two witnesses bring us back. Why? They bring us back because the whole world is fed up of dying. So they bring us back at this time, but it's a deception. It's a fake out. If we're being brought back, think if we're being brought back to the land because they want us to have the land and everyone's repented and blah, 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 we're all good and king singing kumbaya at this time. Why do we have to flee for three and a half years at that time? What happened? It's a deception. 1.7 1.7 billion people died during the three and a half years of the two witnesses. Think about 1.7 billion. That's almost, that's one quarter of the earth. Okay, let's give in. Satan says, let's give in. Let's give in. And we'll put them all together in one spot and we're going to kill them then. Let's get them all back there for Passover. Let's get them all in the land. And then they all go out and they grab you from everywhere and you are like a piece of gold because when we get you back there, it's going to rain again and we can eat and live. So they bring you back to the land. You're all brought back in some miraculous way. I don't know how. Through the two witnesses saying, come out of her, my people, and you're brought back here. And guess what? You may even build something like a temple or something to start a temple. Because he sits in the seat thinking that he is God. Small g. 1.7 billion people are going to die during that three and a half years of those two witnesses. I think that's going to make the front page news. 
and you will be brought back. You will be brought back, and I hope safely, because this is during the time when Israel wasn't hurt. <clears throat> but like we're shown here, it's a deception. Maybe. I don't know if I got it right. Guess what? I'll know when I'm standing here in 2034. In the meantime, this is just interesting stuff. Because right now, you've got to get through the war, the famine, the pestilence, the rape, the cannibalism, which is going to continue here. Yeah, it sucks. And it's going to be very, 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 very bad. But you got to figure out a way to do it, and you got to start praying. you got to start praying now. And you got to get through all this time. So, where are we? We've got atonement, 2033. Passover, 2030. The trumpets, 2026. The two witnesses, the flight of the believers into the wilderness, hiding by Moab. And here we have the 144,000 being raised up at uh, Shavuot. Now what? Now what? Now we turn and open up our Bible to Daniel 8. And an army was given to him against the daily sacrifice. What is the daily sacrifice? The bullocks of your lips. The bullocks of your lips. Your prayers at 9 and 3. Daily. And the daily sacrifice because of transgression and it cast and it, the army, cast the truth to the ground. Your Torah is going to be trampled. And it worked and succeeded. Whatever plan he's got going, it worked. Then I heard a certain holy one, whoa, where'd he come from? Speaking to another holy one, whoa, who's this? The two witnesses, they're talking, I think. And he said to that one who spoke, Till when shall the vision last concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression that astounds to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled? And he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be vindicated. And right away, in my churches of God, where I come from, they make that 1,150 days. And I never understood how they did that, but it fits some theory that they had. It says 2,300 days. So the two holy ones, the two witnesses, have not yet begun their work. This is at the beginning of the 2,300 days. One of them, one of them knows the chronology of the sabbatical and jubilee cycles. That could be you. It could be you. It could be someone that you're going to tell in your assembly. They got to learn this. Wow, who knew? This is amazing. You could be that guy. But you got to know this stuff. The guy you're going to teach it to could be these guys. It could be your son, that 12-year-old that's just coming to learn this stuff. One of them understands the chronology, and the other is asking, how much longer? How much longer? What's going on? Why is it? How much longer? Daniel 8, 19, and he said, Behold, I will make you know, this is the angel talking to Daniel, I will make you know what shall be, what shall happen in the last, in the end of the indignation. For it is for the time appointed. There you go, the appointed times, the holy days. And the vision of the evening and the morning, the morning prayers, the bullocks of your lips, which was told is true. But you shall shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days until they figure out how to keep this battle with you be your cycles. Until now. So we have shown you the 70 Shabuot teaching. You could never understand the 70 weeks prophecy until you understood the sabbatical and Jubilee cycles. And I submit to you now that you cannot understand the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel until you also understand the sabbatical and Jubilee cycles. Because they are connected. Okay. Out of 103 times this word tamid is used, it is said to be the daily sacrifice in each of these verses. And there they all are. 
Numbers 4, 15 to 16, two times. Numbers 29 to 6, uh, verse 6. Daniel 8, 11 and 13, three times. Daniel 11, 31. Daniel 12, 11. It's referring to the daily sacrifice of the prayers that you are offering up to Jehovah. Hebrews 13, 15. By him then let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, confessing his name. Psalm 50, 14. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. That comes through your lips. Psalm 119, 108. I pray you take the free will offering of my mouth, O Jehovah, and teach me your judgments. Hosea 14, 2. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away my iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips our prayers. Remember this. Daniel 8, and this is what he's going to take away, the daily sacrifice. The prayers of your lips from 9, and 3, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. each day. I don't know how he's going to do it, but we're told he's going to do it. So, and I heard a certain holy one speaking to another holy one, said to that one who speaks, until when shall the vision last concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression stones of the sanctuary? The sanctuary. What are we talking about here? We got to go back and do like we did yesterday and look up these words because the sanctuary is not what it's talking about. It doesn't make sense with all the other scriptures that we have. It doesn't, it's not right. So we look up the word, and the word sanctuary is kadosh. It's not kadosh, kadosh. It's not mik kadosh. It's kadosh. And one of the acceptable translations of kadosh is saint. And I'm saying that this sanctuary in this chapter 8 is saint, not the sanctuary, because it fits everything else. And I'm not trying to make an agenda like some people are. Then I heard a certain holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that one who spoke, until when shall the vision last concerning the daily sacrifice? Our prayers. And the transgression that astounds, the abomination. To give both the saints and the whole host of Israel to be trampled. The saints and the whole host of Israel to be trampled. That host is a mass of persons. Organized for war, by implication, a campaign. Literally, a figuratively appointed time. What appointed time? Army, battle, company, host, service, soldier, waiting upon war. The saints and the army of the saints are going to be trampled. Like we've shown you, it is Israel. 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 I'm a cur. Israel. I'm a cur. Israel, Ephraim, Israel, Joseph, Manasseh, Judah, Zebulun, Naphtali, Israel, all of you, that is to be trampled underfoot. How long, how long will the saints and their entire army of people be trampled underfoot? And you are only trampled underfoot when you're dead. when your bones have turned into the gravel of the roads that they're paving over. That's when you're trampled. You're not buried. And after 62 weeks, remember this in Daniel, after 62 weeks, the saints shall be cut off as if they never existed. And the people of a coming prince shall destroy the city and the saints the saints, and the end of it is with a flood. There's that flood again, this army of Satan, and wastes are decreed and fighting until the end. The scariest verse in the entire Bible right there. Psalm 105, 14, my anointed are the saints. Don't harm, don't harm them. But it's coming. We went through this yesterday. Messiah shall be cut off and have not. It is what the scriptures say. It means shall be cut off, another, the new King James, but not for himself. CJB, be cut off and have nothing. 
not exist. This is what it means, I am, not exist. Fatherless, without our Father. Be gone, nothing, to not. Everything you see around you is gone, or will be. It's going to be picked up, packed up, and shipped out to another place, to another country. Israel, all 12 tribes, is going to be cut off, cut down, destroyed, and consumed. And they will be as if they did not exist, as if they were never there. They will be no more. Not exactly right, but there'll be no more in this present age. They will be gone and not exist. The state of Israel, the United States, the United Empire, Britain, and her commonwealth. Gone. In the 70th Jubilee cycle. Daniel, 70 weeks. Gone. There's only 120 of them, and we've proven it to you. We are in that last one. Prove it. Prove it. And if you do, you got to go tell people, you got to tell them what's coming. Daniel 9, 26, to destroy the people. This is another translation of the same verse, to destroy the people. And he shall speak these words, Daniel 7, verse 25, and he shall speak these words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints. Wear out the saints. Daniel 8, 23 to 25, right there in the middle. And destroy the mighty and holy people. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgression have come to a full, a king fierce of face and skilled in intrigue shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, because it comes from Satan. And he shall destroy marvelously. How can you destroy marvelously? It's destruction. He'll be great because he's a conquering king, and shall prosper and work and destroy us. Destroy the USA, destroy Canada. Understand that, don't think this is a dream. I'll kick you so you know you're real. And also through his understanding, he shall cause deceit to, be success, to succeed in his hand. How did the Germans do it during World War II? They told you you were going to an opera and you got on a freight train and you ended up at a different opera than you expected with people singing a different song. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. By peace, by peace. How is he going to do that? By peace, 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 when there is no peace. What we got? We got a UN that's the peace keepers. <laughs> right? The UN. Gaddafi thought they were peacekeepers. Syria almost found out the peacekeepers. And by peace shall just destroy many. The peacekeepers are coming here. What's that mean? Why do they have to come here to keep peace here? I don't know. I don't know. But he shall be broken without hand. Revelation 13, 7. And it was given to it to war with the saints, with us, with the U.S., with United Kingdom, and Australia, and Canada, and to overcome them. And authority was given to it over every tribe and tongue and nation. He has conquered the earth. And all dwelling on the earth will worship it. Those whose names have not been written in the book of life. And what do we say during the days of atonement? May your name be found in the book of life. Jehovah be with you. It's an expression they used to say, but let's say it with meaning. Jehovah be with you because you need him. You need them. Say it with meaning. Jehovah be with you. Because you need them or you're going to be dead. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads in the captivity will go into captivity. And if anyone will kill with a sword, he also must be killed by a sword. Be patient. Wait upon Jehovah to deliver you. It's not going to be that easy. The saints are the ones that are going to be killed. 
the sanctuary is not the sanctuary, it's the saints. And it's until the saints are vindicated, until vengeance is taken for the saints at the end. It's the saints. It's the saints. The 2300 days begins on a high holy day and ends on a high holy day. So right now we've brought you backwards, doing reverse engineering. We brought you to 2026, the Feast of Trumpets, when the two witnesses begin. But the saints are talking about the 2300 days. Now my friend is able to figure it out that it's always landing on a holy day. And he's calculated them all out. And I'm too lazy to do all his calculations because he hurt my brain. But when you take 2300 days from the trumpets here and go backwards, it brings you to Shavuot in 2020. Wow! Oh no! Another four sabbatical cycle of war. 2020, the prophecy of Nida. Why does it keep coming there? Now, let's be fair. Our friend from Australia, and I don't want to embarrass him because this might be heard on the radio or TV, he calculated all his calculations. He started here, and he's also now thinking he might start there, but he ends up here with all these calculations. He could be right. He could be right. He's doing pure math, and I know that hurts some of us. <laughs> the thing is, he has been revealed these things the same as I have. He's got a different opinion than I do, but we're all in the ballpark here. Who's right? Who cares? It only matters when you get to there. Actually, when you get to there, because then you can breathe. But between here or there, now remember there, if he's right and it starts there, what's that? That's when Abraham went into Hagar to conceive Ishmael, who's born here, the Muslim force. Remember, I told you Assyria, the ten toes of clay and iron, Assyria, the iron, the clay, the Arab, the mixture, the ten toes of iron and clay. If he's right and they start here or there or there, I don't know which one's right. But my thinking, the way I see things, and he may have agreed with me yesterday. Shavuot 2020 is the way I see it right now. And that could change. Funny how these all work out to land on appointed days, high days. If you're not keeping the high days, you have no clue how prophecy is going to work out in the end. All you're doing at best is guessing. And if you're not keeping the sabbatical and jubilee years, you have no clue. So you can be like those camping groups of people wearing signs, the end is near, October 31st. Oops, no, that was after we said May 31st. You have no clue, you're just guessing. We know this is the 120th Jubilee cycle. We know. We know this is a fourth sabbatical cycle and lines up with the fourth curse. We know. We know that when we do the prophecy of Nita, it lines up with the fourth sabbatical cycle. We also know that 2020 is in the middle between 1996 and 2044. It's directly in the middle. And Shavuot is in the middle of that. Our soldiers, your soldiers, your young men, your boys, the American army, the Canadian army, the British army will be bleeding out. They will fight valiantly, but they're going to bleed out. And we're going to be overrun and overwhelmed by what is coming. Here's what I'm going to show you tomorrow. That's why this was to be the end of my presentation. But here's what I'm going to show you tomorrow. Because there's something else. There's a covenant made with many. Okay, so close your eyes, pretend you're asleep so you're not going to really listen. Then tomorrow it'll be new news to you. Oh, wow. 
the covenant made with many. It began in 1972. I'm just going to mention now, I won't get into the details because that's tomorrow. The details, the proof is in the pudding. The details is there. See my good grammar, the details are there. The United Nations Conference on Human Environment convened in Stockholm, Sweden, June 5th to 16th in 1972. whoop to doo what's that mean? I'll explain that tomorrow, but guess what? Just do a little math, get home, go home and do this. Count from there. Count up the years, follow them all the way up. Guess where you end up? 2020, again. What are we talking about here? This covenant made with many. Every nation in the world has signed up to this covenant. This is a good agreement. We're saving the earth, the trees, the environment, Mother Nature. I didn't say that. Mother Nature is anti-Torah. Mother Nature is another god. It's called Gaia. Oh, I'll save some for tomorrow, Joel. It's the worship of another god. Now, into that covenant with many, they added the human rights, the rights of the gays. I'm seeing it on TV. The rights of the homosexuals on TV. I'll get arrested for this in Canada. Homosexuals, gays, bisexuals, transvestites, all have the same rights. And that was inserted into the human rights and inserted into the, this agenda on the environment. When you take this jubilee cycle, guess what? Here's one jubilee cycle. It ended this week, this covenant with many. Just, just a little thing I did. Started there, went back three and a half jubilee cycles. Three and a half jubilee cycles. Guess what I learned? I don't have it here. It's just something I just remembered. I ended up when the first Geneva Convention was created. The first Geneva Convention was created, I believe, in 18... 51, after a guy riding through northern Italy comes across a field of dead and wounded soldiers from both armies and nobody helping them. So he goes into the city and rounds up all the women and gets all the bandages he can. He comes out and starts caring for, for both and he says, don't look at the uniform, just treat the soldier no matter which side they're on. And that was the beginning of the first Geneva Convention. Then they had the second and the third. And all these conventions. Then they have uh, Hague. I think the, the Hague, there's two or three of them. Then they had the League of Nations. And then they got the United Nations. All these things are created to tell you how to war with civility. <laughs> think about it. Right now in the news, Everyone is up in arms over Syria using gas to kill people. Well, they killed, what, 400, 140 civilians? 400 civilians? I forget the number. Maybe it's 1,000. Let's say 1,000. They killed 1,000. That's bad. But there's over 100,000 other people killed by bombs and rape and murder and genocide. I'm in the wrong religion. You're dead. Watch the YouTubes coming out of Syria. They are heartbreaking. I watched three truck drivers go out one day, stop at a checkpoint. Are you Sunni? Yep. You Sunni? Yep. You Sunni? Yep. Come over here. We want to talk to you. Put them in the middle of the road, machine gun them. The guys that are doing the checkpoint are Shia. Oops. Wrong answer. They went out in the morning to go and do a job just like I would in a truck and come home do the, and feed their family. They just went to work. And then they come back and they're dead. Well, they don't come back, they're dead. <laughs> just test, testing, see if you're awake. This is coming here. And from the time, okay, here's another thing, Daniel 12, 11, from the time of the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the desolation abomination set up 1,290 days. What was taken away? The prayers of your books. And I believe that starts at the same time the 2,300 days does. 
So now, okay, this one, this one might be a little dicey for you. But from now, you count 23, or 1,290 days from Shavuot. And you end up at Christmas. You end up at Christmas in 2023. Hmm. The abomination set up is what? It's Christmas. It's Molech. It's Molech worship. 2023 is what? It's the year before the captivity. It's a Shavuot. Or not Shavuot, it's a sabbatical year. And now during the days of captivity, if you don't bow down and worship this thing, you get your head knocked off, whacked off, chopped off. The latter days are now here. And it is now possible to understand this prophecy because you understand the sabbatical and jubilee cycles. And you guys, you know it. I don't have to convince you anymore. You know it now. You know what it means. What I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, what I want you to get through your heads. This is the part that's made me sick. This is the part that's kept me up at nights. This is the reason I have to do this. And this is the reason you have to do it. Because if I'm right, if I'm right, and these things start here at Shavuot, and I'm not 100, you know, I'm, yeah, I am, I'm 100% sure, but, there's always a but, if they start here at Shavuot and go 2,300 days to 2026, and then the three and a half years to Shabbat Shuvah, and then the three and a half years of tribulation, and then, and then, and then we're changed. Count the years, not the days, count the years. That's 13 years. That's 13 years. Take a look at the things that are coming out of Darfur. Remember the Darfur stuff in Sudan? The women were raped. It also says in Leviticus 26, which is where I come from, which is why I'm doing this, because these are the curses here that you'll fight. You will fight over the afterbirth from these rapes. You'll fight over the afterbirth and the birth. You'll fight over who gets to eat what part of that baby. You have a job to do. You have to tell people this. And it's not nice and it's not pretty and it can't be wrapped up in a nice little bow on it and say, that was fun. Right now, in Norway, in Sweden, I had an article a couple months ago about the rapes of the Norwegians and the Swedes because they were recording them. And they were raped, and Judith helped me put this together, and she was sick. She was so sick of reading this stuff and finding this stuff and researching it. She just wanted me to get it done and get it over so we don't have to deal with it anymore. And it made me sick, too. And it made Daniel sick. They're raping the blonde-haired, blue-eyed women of Sweden and Norway, because that's the image they have of all these things, pornography pictures and movies that we ship out to the Middle East. So every time you buy a Playboy magazine, every time you encourage it or go to a strip club, you good Catholic person, you good Christian sitting there thinking you're holier than thou, you're supporting the rape of your men and women when they come back to this land because it's coming back to bite you in the butt so hard that you're going to puke. Those seven years of plenty that we talked about before, again, so you know, so you remember. Who is this? This is Babylon. The seven years of plenty were for Babylon. The rest of the world, who suffered? Israel suffered. They came into Babylon. So you see the analogy? They brought them into Babylon. Okay. Seven years of plenty. Every piece of steel, every piece of copper, every piece of gold will be dragged out of the United States by you and your wife and your daughters and your sons as slave labor. And you'll do it for free. And you might be fed. 
and you probably will be raped. For seven years, and you're going to build up the wealth of the United Europe and the army of the United Europe and the strength of the United Europe, which connects with the south, the north of Africa and the Muslim forces. But notice, remember 2026? Remember 2026, the two witnesses get started? Now the three and a half years or the three years that they're working is seven years of destruction, the seven years of famine for the beast power. So all I'm doing is comparing the life of Joseph here with what's coming. Babylon, Egypt is the one that has the seven years of plenty. Babylon, Egypt, United Europe, seven years of plenty at your expense, Mekur. But then the two witnesses get to work. Finally, finally, Mekur, finally. You know what it means to afflict your soul because you will be so afflicted it will make you sick. A gun at your head watching your daughter get raped. The next checkpoint, it's your wife. If you move, you die. If you move, she's dead. If you move, we shoot all the kids. And this stuff in Darfur, the kids had to sit and watch. It's happening now in Syria. This is modern history, and it's coming to you till you get to know what afflict is, you proud and stubborn people. They will prosper at your expense. Free labor. They, when the two witnesses come and our Jehovah comes, they will pay the price then. That's when the vengeance will be given back to them. I just found my articles. These are just things I just grabbed off the internet this morning because I wanted to tell you, show you stuff, but you get the point. This is Sudan. It's a weapon of war. Darfur. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call romantically here in North America a harem. A harem, those are things that we think in North America are romantic. We get all these women and we can do what we want with. Guess what? They got minds and feelings of their own and they don't want you jumping on them. Especially after they've watched you be killed, their husband and their boys and their children. That's what Mohammed did to this Jewish girl that he made his wife. He killed her husband in front of her. He killed, I think, the rest of her family. And then he put her into her harem because she was war booty. It's continuing to go on now. It hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. And you, not you, but you in your lily white perfect little house with a garden picket white fence. Food that revenge on you. Allah. 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 So we can invade their country and take their wives and war booty. Allah. 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 So we can invade their country and take their wives and war booty. Allah. 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 It's coming here. To you. Now you know why I'm so passionate about trying to get this message out and why I overcome all my inability to talk, my inability to read, my inability to spell, and I don't give a damn if I look like a fool. Because this is coming here and I've got family that this is going to affect. This has made me sick. And I've been wrestling with that all week and fearful of what you might think of me. And I'm so glad to hear what I heard yesterday from you all. And I'm so glad to feel the support that you're giving me in just to present this message to you today and yesterday. We have a job to do. Not just me, 
not just me. We have these books here to help you teach and understand the sabbatical and jubilee year cycles. And every question I've ever been asked has been answered in those books. So any of the questions that you're asking me is not new. It's in the book. And the explanation is in the book, is in detail. Take them. Share them. Tell people about this. The Prophecies of Abraham, yes, it's a difficult book to understand when this whole subject is brand new to you. You've never heard it before. Teach this, tell this, show this to people. The feathers are about to hit the fan. You need to tell them. And they will, ru they will ruin by flattery those who do evil against the covenant. But the people who know their Yah will be strong and will work. And those who understand among the people shall teach many. You will teach many because he wants to help you get this message out. Amos, it says, he will not do nothing unless he first tells his prophets. And who are the prophets? Those who speak Torah. That's you. That's me. That doesn't mean I'm like, I'm a super prophet. No, we're all prophets because we're speaking Torah. I am nobody here. I am just as insecure and scared as you are. And when we fall, we're going to have just a little bit of help. And many will join them with hypocrisy. And many of those who understand shall stumble. Yes, we will still be martyred to refine and purge us all. And to make white to the time of the end. Because it is yet for an appointed time. If you're not doing the work, you're not doing anything. This monster in front of us is so flipping huge, it's unbelievable. In 2005, I heard this story. And I got, just wanted to stand up and do something because I could see these not these truths I presented today, but I could see another truth that I needed to share, and that was the Sabbatical Jubilee Cycles. I had nothing. I just had the understanding of it. I had no help. I got kicked out of my church for trying to tell them. I lost my friends. I lost my family. I lost everything. I just kept going. When I stand in the Valley of Eli and I tell them, this monster is huge. This set, this, this big creation, that's just huge. But you, David, you've got Yah on your side. We've got Jehovah. You only need one sling shot. You don't need those other five, four stones. So I'll ask you the question that I was asked. Who's going to stand up for Jehovah? Who's going to stand in the gap in the wall and defend it from the enemy? Who's going to stand up? Just like I asked you, is this the basket? Is this the barley? Who's going to stand up for Jehovah? And the people said, yes. Who's going to stand up for Jehovah? And the people said, yes. You hear them? Who's going to stand up for Jehovah and defend the Torah? Who? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a job to do, and playing religion is now done. It's done. Grab your five stones and let's get to work. It's done. Joseph F. Dumont explores every question about the sabbatical and jubilee years in Remembering the Sabbatical Year 2016. In order to understand the truth, you have to expose those things that are not true. What is left is then the facts. Remembering the sabbatical years examines all the theories put forward 
as to when the sabbatical years were, and then using your own Bible shows you how to be able to prove it for yourself. Once you do this, then you too can understand prophecy and in what season the Messiah is to come. Filled with groundbreaking insights, remembering the sabbatical years of 2016 is both a source of wisdom and practical knowledge on an important yet complex subject and a necessary guidebook for prevailing through today's times. The Creator of the universe has set upon His creation a construct of keeping time, and within that construct of keeping time, He has also given certain instructions. These markers of time have everything to do with prophecy as well, for they are the language by which boundaries are set and milestones are crossed. Prophecy affects every living human being on the planet, and so the reader becomes the main character in this book. We have, for all the world, an example of a people who kept and also did not keep the Sabbath years as instructed, and you will see what happened to them in each of these cases. You cannot afford to be ignorant of these things. The curses for not keeping the sabbatical years are happening now all around us, and they are getting worse. We are to wrestle with the Word to get the truth. Get your copy today and begin to understand world events today from a biblical understanding.